Hello. One of the research topics that has fascinated archaeologists for a very long time is the topic of social and economic inequality. Archaeologists wonder why it is that most modern societies have very high degrees of social inequality, and they usually assume that at one time all human societies were egalitarian, although we don't want to put uh, too much significance on that term in terms of equality, because even in egalitarian societies there were differences among people. Uh, for example, there were differences between men and women and between members of the community of different ages. But at some point in human history, well, I shouldn't even say some point, probably at lots of different points in human history, some societies began to choose different paths and uh, acquired some degree of what archaeologists sometimes call social complexity. But what this complexity really involves is not simply uh, an increase in sort of the number of roles in society or anything like that, although that's part of it, but it has a significant component of some people being better off than others in society, having greater access to food and other resources, for example, or greater access to power. So in today's video, I'd like to explore some of those themes. When we think of inequality, we tend to think in terms of inequalities in wealth. But that's really only just one kind of inequality. There can also be inequalities in health status, inequality in prestige, and in access to resources like food. There can also be inequality in access to mates, or access to ritual knowledge. One important aspect of inequality is whether or not it breaks along gender lines. For example, in Victorian Europe and North America, women definitely did not enjoy the same rights and privileges as men. But this is by no means universal. For example, archaeologists used to assume that in prehistoric societies, hunting, which was a prestigious activity, was only done by men, or perhaps by men and boys. But we now have evidence that in some prehistoric societies, women could also be hunters, especially where the hunting equipment included at ladles or spear throwers, or bows and arrows. And stress markers on skeletons show that in some early agricultural societies, men, and not only women, participated in the very strenuous task of grinding corn or grain into flour. Of course, these kinds of inequality can interact, and all of them have implications for inequality in power. When we think about inequality, we also have to consider the scale. For example, in a particular society, there might be considerable equality among households, yet inequality among household members, with some households potentially even including slaves. In many instances, inequality cross-cuts household groups, with differences in well-being and power among classes or castes, for example. In the second half of the 19th century, many scholars simply assumed that societies like Victorian England were at the apex of human evolution, with complex uh, states that included high degrees of social and economic uh, difference among classes in society, and a kind of progressivist idea of how societies changed over time. These theories often served as justification for imperialist and colonial ambitions. As various nation states displaced indigenous peoples, whom they considered less civilized than the settlers who were replacing them. These unjust land grabs were thus accomplished under the guise of progress. And institutionalized inequality was just one aspect of that so-called progress. Modern archaeologists, by contrast, would prefer not to treat this process as inevitable, and were more interested in trying to figure out where and how and why this process occurred. Archaeologists were actually a little bit late coming to the party on this question, as philosophers had already been debating it well before Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote his Discourses on the Origins and Foundations of the Inequality Among Men in 1754. In Rousseau's camp were people who viewed indigenous people as examples of the noble savage, uncorrupted by civilization. In the other camp were those who followed Thomas Hobbes's view that the people without civilization led lives that were nasty, brutish, and short. But members of both camps tended to view social change as passage through a series of stages, with the implication that many modern indigenous people were just arrested examples of some early stage of development. <laughs> 
In the 19th century, one very popular system of stages was that of Lewis Henry Morgan. Morgan saw most hunter-gatherers as belonging to the savagery stage. Societies that had developed agriculture and animal husbandry belonged to the barbarism stage. And civilizations were societies that had things like writing and metallurgy. Despite their very different political leanings, Morgan's work was a big influence on that of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, with their model of social development from primitive communism to capitalism. Although archaeologists have long since abandoned Morgan's system of stages, since the mid-20th century we've used other systems of classification for societies that still have some echoes of Morgan's scheme. One of those is the classification of the anthropologist Morton Freed, with four categories of egalitarian, ranked, stratified, and state. You might be tempted to think that egalitarian societies are ones in which everybody's equal, but that would be a mistake. In fact, there can be many differences among people in egalitarian societies, but the only ascribed statuses are ones established by your sex or your age. All other statuses are ones that people can achieve or acquire or earn over the course of their lives, and there may be no limit on how many people can achieve some particularly desirable status. And although people may own some personal possessions, most things of value are held communally, and there are few, if any, differences in wealth. By contrast, in rank societies, some statuses are definitely more desirable, and there may be limits on how many people can occupy them. For example, there may be only two keepers of ritual paraphernalia, or only one chief. In stratified societies, differences among people are even more pronounced, and members of upper classes have better access to the necessities of life than people in lower classes. Finally, there are state societies, with governments that have monopolies over lawmaking and law enforcement, and usually heightened political and economic inequality. A competing social classification, also from the 1960s, was that of Elman Service. Service also had four categories, band, tribe, chiefdom, and state. And although these are similar in some ways to Freed's categories, there are also important differences in that service focused on group size and institutional organization rather than access to the necessities of life. In bands, his rough equivalent to egalitarian societies, there is little or no formal organization, and disputes are settled informally. For example, through mediation or negotiation, or even jokes and ridicule. While bands are very small, tribes are much larger in size, potentially with hundreds of members, usually divided into at least two subgroups. Tribes also have more formal mechanisms for dispute resolution, and may have a small group of leaders or a headman who resolve such disputes and also make communal decisions for the community. But typically these are not hereditary positions. The next two categories are more relevant to our topic of inequality, because they both include a significant component of redistribution. For example, in a chiefdom, the chief collects food and other resources from members of the community and then redistributes it. In principle, this can be an equitable redistribution so that no one in the community goes hungry. But it also creates the potential for the chief, his family, and close supporters to keep a larger proportion of goods for themselves than they dole out to the rest of the community. This kind of situation is heightened in state societies, where the government has a monopoly on force and can thus force citizens to pay tithes or taxes. While a portion of these taxes can be used for public works and distribution to the poor, a large proportion can go to enrich the elites who are closely associated with the government. For this reason, archaeologists are often interested in any evidence for redistribution. One fairly recent book has pushed back against these stage-like models. In The Dawn of Everything, David Graeber and David Wengrow, among other things, suggest that so-called egalitarian societies have a lot more complexity than most people have credited them for. However, they can accomplish this complexity without coercion or high levels of inequality, and many communal decisions can be based on consensus. While wealth isn't the only avenue for inequality,
It is a very important one, especially in stratified and state societies. In such societies, it's common for a very small proportion of the population to own the vast majority of the society's wealth, while the vast majority of people belong to the lower classes and have little or no wealth. But where does this idea of wealth even come from? As already mentioned, people in egalitarian societies have hardly any personal possessions, let alone any wealth. But in some ranked societies, wealth may have as much or more to do with prestige as with the necessities of life. Heirlooms like shell necklaces, once owned by highly prestigious ancestors, are passed down through the generations, becoming highly coveted wealth items. While these wealth items were exchanged in a prestige economy, they could also become associated with exchanges in more useful resources. The most famous example of that was the Kula Ring of the Western Pacific. Participants in the Kula Ring traveled hundreds of kilometers across the ocean by canoe in order to conduct these exchanges, with red shell necklaces traveling in a clockwise direction and white shell armbands traveling in a counterclockwise direction. Once the ceremonial exchange was complete, the chiefs and lineage heads who had privileged access to the Kula Ring were able to make exchanges in other goods by way of barter. This would make them the main conduit of those goods to their own communities. In some parts of the world, wealth items were not purely symbolic, but also had practical value. An excellent example of this in some prehistoric societies was the volcanic glass called obsidian. Its excellent napping qualities and ability to take on an extremely sharp edge made it highly desirable as a stone tool resource. Obsidian could be napped into truly beautiful tools that would no doubt have brought prestige on both their makers and their possessors. And in some societies, obsidian was also used to make mirrors that almost certainly were prestige items. While many wealth items acquire some of their desirability by being rare, in agricultural societies, the most widespread and storable forms of food often became a type of wealth. Seed crops like wheat and rice are easily storable, making them ideal for redistribution. And, as already noted in this video, redistribution can either be equitable or it can provide opportunities for those who manage the redistribution to take unfair advantage for themselves. Wherever people were highly dependent on such crops, they had to deal with risks like droughts. And also some farmers were just unlucky in that they got stuck with land that was not very fertile or that didn't have very easy access to water. While other farmers may have had more fertile or better watered land to produce much larger crops or land that they could improve through irrigation. Where land was held communally, it was possible to mitigate or at least spread out these risks by rotating the assignment of fields to families from year to year. On the other hand, if land was owned privately or leased, redistribution could solve part of the problem of some families being disadvantaged. Redistribution might involve the use of centralized granaries, where a chief or administrator collected the grain grown by multiple families. In the case of ancient Egypt, for example, these granaries may have been under the charge of a temple. But such redistributive economies may go back much earlier than ancient Egypt. For example, in the late Neolithic of northern Iraq, we find sites like Umm Dabagiya, where there are large buildings with small cells in rows that are almost certainly storage buildings of some kind. Such buildings suggest redistribution on a really huge scale, even before 6000 BC. In state societies, like the Moche and Inca of the Andes, large state storehouses provide physical evidence of redistribution even when the stored goods were tangible assets, like textiles. Once people had domesticated food animals, livestock became another potential source of wealth. Somewhat like compound interest bank accounts, herds could grow in size, especially when herders were careful about how they managed them. But herds were also vulnerable to a number of risks, including disease, poor availability of pasture, and raiding by outside groups. Some societies may have mitigated these risks by communal ownership of herds, or by lending animals to families that had lost their herds. But the latter scenario also provides opportunities for the people who are making the loans. 
Did the recipients of this generosity only have to pay back the number of animals they'd originally borrowed? Or did they have to reciprocate with something more, something similar to modern interest payments? In some societies, some combination of lending out starter herds, raiding neighboring societies, natural growth in the herds, and receiving animals as part of dowries or bride wealth allowed some individuals in some societies to become very wealthy. In such contexts, kinship systems and inheritance rules could make a big difference to the potential for inequalities in wealth, status, and access to mates. It should probably come as no surprise that in many societies, animals became a form of currency. In early Greece and Rome, for example, even commodities like gold were measured in units of oxen. Regrettably, in some societies, it wasn't much of a stretch to go from ownership of animals to ownership of people. And slavery, often based on the enslavement of conquered people, became an important way for some people to become very wealthy and very powerful. Not only could slave owners acquire wealth through the productive activities of their slaves, for example, when slaves helped to process huge amounts of salmon on the North American Northwest Coast, individuals or groups could acquire great wealth either through the slave trade itself or by the military activities that generated large numbers of slaves. For example, acquisition of great wealth both for the benefit of the state and for the benefit of individual senators, was one of the incentives for ancient Rome's many wars. Roman senators were expected to be millionaires, and commanding an army that was likely to take lots of booty was one of the ways that they could maintain this wealth. As just one example, Julius Caesar's campaigns in Gaul allowed him to accumulate enormous sums. It's estimated that, while in Gaul, Caesar's armies captured about 500,000 slaves. In fact, they captured so many that there was a decrease in the price of slaves in Rome, possibly pushing the price as low as 16 sestertii per person. Even at that low price, it would have yielded 8 million sestertii. And although the income from selling the slaves was shared among the state and the entire army, Caesar's share would have been the largest one. Partly as a result of these campaigns, at his death, Caesar's net worth was around 400 million sesterti, roughly equivalent to $1.6 billion. Needless to say, any society that has slavery has among the worst social inequality. Whether it was in ancient Rome or in the New World during the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, there's no way to sugarcoat the fact that enslaved people had little to no power relative to their enslavers. Many societies that had wealth in the form of agricultural surplus or livestock or slaves eventually hit on precious metals as the premier standard of value and a major form of wealth. Metals like copper, silver, and gold were easy to measure by their weight. And they don't decay away as could stores of grain or be vulnerable to disease like livestock. And because some of these metals, especially gold, were extremely valuable relative to their weight, much more valuable even than oxen, you could carry, conceal, or store a very large amount of wealth in a relatively small space. In the Bronze Age, over much of the Old World, metallic currency took the form of ingots, sometimes shaped somewhat like bracelets but they tended to vary quite a lot in their weight. In the first millennium BC, communities in Anatolia and Greece began to strike small disks of gold or silver with designs. What made these little disks coins was that they were struck and issued by states. And while these coins may have facilitated trade, the monopoly that the state had over the production of coinage essentially allowed them to tax wealth. For every coin the state made, it kept back a small percentage of the gold or silver that it contained. The court of the Persian Empire was also pretty quick to adopt coinage, and later coin-based economies spread through the Roman Empire and beyond. Eastern Asia began to make coinage at roughly the same time as the Mediterranean region, but in a very different tradition. For one thing, rather than silver and gold, right from the start most of their coins were made of bronze or copper.
And after a few centuries of experimenting with coins shaped like agricultural tools, China soon settled on round coins cast in molds with a central hole. These coins were individually of extremely low value. So the hole facilitated stringing them together in groups of thousands. Even before the advent of paper money, not all wealth took the form of metals, however. For example, in the pre-Hispanic Andes, although some wealth took the form of silver and gold, wealth often took the form of textiles. And among the Aztecs, a common form of currency was standard units of cocoa beans. Differences among skeletons in the incidence of various pathologies that leave traces on the bones can be a source of information about health inequalities. Some of these pathologies could be due to things like lack of access to clean water, but many of them are due to malnutrition. For example, when growing children experience periods of nutritional stress, they may develop Harris lines in their long bones. And if Harris lines occur in children associated with some households, but not in others, that would suggest that some families had much better access to food than did others. A similar source of evidence for potential childhood malnutrition is enamel hypoplasia. This is a dental defect that leaves lines on the teeth that can be caused by malnutrition, such as vitamin D deficiency. Differences in dental health more generally can also be revealing, particularly because eating soft or sugary foods can lead to higher incidences of dental caries. Another common type of paleopathology involves porous lesions on the roofs of the eye sockets, called cribra orbitalia. It has long been thought that this, and a similar pathology called parotic hyperostosis, were caused by iron deficiencies. For example, from not having enough red meat in one's diet. Some recent research sheds doubt on this anemia hypothesis. However, whatever the proximate causes of these conditions, stark differences in their incidence in a population would nonetheless indicate inequalities in health. However, we should be careful about associating health with high status or wealth. After all, in some societies, High status people will have access to foods that aren't actually very good for them. And their privileged access to foods could lead to obesity or diabetes. Spirituality, ritual, and religious knowledge can be distributed throughout a society. But in many societies, there are also ritual specialists, such as shamans or priests, who have enhanced ritual knowledge and sometimes enjoy enhanced prestige, or even power. At the other end of the spectrum, there can also be religious specialists who are treated almost as outcasts. Being segregated from society, at least some times of the year, and sometimes even having to beg for their food. It's not necessarily easy for us to identify this kind of inequality on the basis of archaeological evidence alone. However, Archaeologists do sometimes find burials with such unusual grave goods as to suggest that the interred person was some kind of religious specialist. One example of this is a grave from the cave site of Hilatzon Tachtit in Israel. It belongs to the Natufian culture and is about 12,000 years old. It contained the remains of an elderly disabled woman, along with such unusual grave goods as marten skulls, an eagle's wing, some 50 complete tortoise shells, and body parts of wild boar, leopard, and some other animals, including an extra human foot. The excavators interpreted this as the burial of a shaman, and it seems likely that such special statuses were more common in prehistory than our evidence would lead us to expect. Whether associated with health, wealth, gender, or religion, some people in the past, as today, enjoyed privileged prestige. Sometimes these prestige roles may have been associated with special kinds of artifacts that signaled the bearer's high status. Among the better candidates for such prestige objects 
are the contents of a hoard of mostly copper objects found in the cave of Nahal Mishmar in Israel. These date to the Chalcolithic period, roughly 6,000 years ago, and include large numbers of copper objects that look like scepters or maces, some of which are quite elaborate and could plausibly be interpreted as a sort of badge of office. There's even one item that looks suspiciously like a crown. Spectacular mortuary remains can provide evidence for stark differences in both prestige and wealth. For example, the royal tombs of Ur not only contain lots of wealth items, they also included the skeletal remains of servants and retainers who apparently were killed to accompany their master or mistress to the afterworld. And the tomb of the Chinese emperor Xin Shu Wang contained an entire army of life-size terracotta statues. This was a gesture of respect far in excess of anything accorded to people of less prestige than the emperor. But aside from these highly anomalous examples, it may not be obvious how we identify differences in wealth or prestige in antiquity. One avenue that archaeologists have attempted is to look for differences in the size or elaboration of houses, with the idea that wealthy or high-status households would have more luxurious residences. Where there are sufficient archaeological exposures, another is to look for differences among houses in either the volume of storage facilities or the frequency of high status or high value items, such as metal or obsidian. But one of the more common approaches is to examine cemetery data for differences among graves in the number or kind of valuable grave goods. Whatever basis we want to use to assess inequality in ancient societies, we need some way to measure it. One possibility is to use what's called a Lorenz curve. Let's say, for example, that we've excavated a Bronze Age cemetery, and we have some reason to believe that bronze axes found in the graves are a measure of wealth. Some of the graves have one or two axes, others have quite a few, and some of them have none at all. To make a Lorenz curve, we start out by ordering our graves from ones that have no axes at all to the one that has the greatest number of axes. This ranking, when converted into the cumulative percentage of graves, constitutes the x-axis of our graph. On the y-axis, we put the cumulative percentage of axes. For example, if the lowest ranked grave has no axes at all, that means its cumulative percentage is zero. If the second ranked grave has one axe and there are 100 axes altogether, that means its cumulative percentage is one. And if the third ranked grave has two axes, or 2%, that means its cumulative percentage is 1 plus 2, which equals 3%. Now, if all the graves had exactly the same number of axes, then the order along the x-axis would be completely arbitrary, and the points along our graph would follow the diagonal dashed line. Consequently, some people would call this the line of equality. However, it seems much more likely that graves would vary in the number of axes so that when we rank them from least to greatest number, we get a curve that looks something like this. The graves represented by points in the lower left part of the graph are ones that have only one axe or none at all, while graves represented by points at upper right are ones that have multiple axes. The area between the resulting curve and the diagonal line gives us one possible measure for the degree of inequality. That's because if all the graves were roughly equal in the number of axes, the points would be very close to that diagonal line. And the more unequal the graves are, the more the points will diverge from that diagonal line. Lorenz curves can be very handy for comparing inequality. For example, if we had another cemetery that dates a little bit later, or two groups of graves at the same cemetery, an early group and a later group, the Lorenz curve for the later group might look like this. The area between the curve and the diagonal line is greater than in the previous example, indicating greater inequality. Another nice thing about Lorenz curves is that we can plot more than one curve on the same graph to facilitate comparison. In this case, we can see clearly that the second group of graves has greater inequality than the first group does.
Cumulative graphs like this also make it easy to pull out certain kinds of information. For example, we can see that 50% of the axes are held by only 13% of the graves. And 25% of the axes are concentrated in the upper 5%. Meanwhile, fully half the graves have less than 10% of the axes. And the bottom 38% of the graves have no axes at all. One of the first archaeologists to use Lorenz curves to try to identify inequality in cemetery data was Ian Morris. He applied the method to bronze and Iron Age graves in ancient Greece, using ceramic vases rather than bronze axes as one of his main proxies for wealth. We could also use Lorenz curves to analyze other sources of evidence for inequality. For example, if we assume that wealthier households will tend to have larger houses, we can rank houses across the x-axis from smallest to largest and put cumulative house area on the y-axis. Of course, no house will ever have an area of zero, so even the smallest house will lie a little bit above the x-axis. In this case, the curve rises gradually at first because all of the smallish houses tend to be roughly the same size. But it rises quite steeply at upper right because the largest few houses are unusually large. While Lorenz curves can be useful for archaeologists, they're not the be-all and end-all. For starters, whether we're looking for inequality in wealth or some other thing, we have to ask ourselves whether or not the proxies we're using, bronze axes or something else, are actually measuring what we think they're measuring. In other words, whether or not they're valid. As with most archaeological cases, we also have to worry about whether or not we have an adequate sample of the graves in order to make generalizations about inequality in whole cemeteries. Furthermore, there can be more than one kind of grave good in the graves. For example, instead of just bronze axes, the grave goods could also include various kinds of jewelry and perhaps ceramic vessels. This kind of mixture of different kinds of grave goods, whose relative values are unknown to us, was one of the problems that Ian Morris faced. And when we apply this to burials, we also have to question our assumptions about ancient mortuary practices. We should keep in mind that funerals have at least as much to do with the living as with the dead. And tempting though it may be to think that rich burial goods are telling us something about the status or wealth of the deceased, it may instead tell us something about the negotiations for status among the living people who attended the funeral. And problems with the application of Lorenz curves are not restricted to cemetery data. When we apply them to distributions of houses, for example, usually our proxy is house size. But house size can vary for a variety of reasons besides wealth or status. Most obviously, houses can be larger when they have larger numbers of full-time residents, or when those residents anticipate having large numbers of guests. They can also be larger when they contain specialized work areas, for craft production, for example. Or they may be smaller because it's anticipated that they'll only be used for a short time. So, Lorenz curves provide a useful tool for interrogating data that might be relevant to social, economic, or some other kind of inequality. However, we have to keep in mind that these kinds of inequalities are multifaceted and likely to have much more complexity than we could expect to capture in such a simple graph. Anyway, I hope you found something of interest in that video, and I encourage you to click on the subscribe button if you'd like to be alerted when I publish new videos. Thank you, and stay safe.